Let's go and get started if we can. Uh, I hope that we will be able to have a Q&A afterward, uh, but I really want to take you to a text of Scripture this morning and just give you a piece of what the New Testament speaks to us about prayer. So if you do have a copy of God's Word, let me ask you if you would join me over in Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. Uh, before we jump in, I did want to give you a book recommendation. As you walk out of a session like this, it's always good to think about what are the resources that I could use. And one of the uh, formative books over the last, say, five to ten years in my life is by a man named Paul Miller. It's called A Praying Life. A praying life. It's been a, a real blessing in my life, and it's really accessible. So let me just recommend it to you as a, as a resource for you on prayer as you uh, leave this morning's session and hopefully challenged by the Scriptures uh, as we look at it together. My name is Stephen. I'm one of the pastors over at Faith Baptist Church. I also teach here at Southeastern Seminary. And uh, man, it's... Uh, it's one of the privileges of my life and ministry to be able to talk about uh, prayer and hopefully challenge all of us even more in our own personal prayer lives um, this morning. So let me ask the Lord to be with us and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace to us. Thank you for the time that we can share uh, and talk about such an important topic as how we communicate with you, the living God the one who has sent your Son to be our Redeemer. And so, Lord, we, we come to you this morning and pray that by the power of your Spirit, you would help us to listen to the Word of God and, and put ourselves under the Word and allow your Spirit to bring it to life in us and to challenge us to be people of prayer. Lord, I believe that it indeed is the, the life and power of the church. So would you challenge us with this, encourage us with this text, uh, even this morning we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. I don't know how much you've read the book of Colossians, but Colossians is just a really, really rich New Testament book in which the Apostle Paul uh, teaches us about the gospel. If you're really looking for one short book that gives you uh, the whole story, get into Colossians because it gives you so much rich uh, gospel teaching, and I would challenge you with it. Uh, Paul is telling us then in the end of the, in the, of, the, of, the um, of the book of Colossians, this letter of how to live out the gospel as the church. This book really is all about Christ and how Christ is living in us and uh, living through us. Uh, we find out in the book of Colossians, just as a bit of background, Jesus has saved us. He's given us new life. He's made us new. Uh, we have in this new life put off our old self and put on the new self. He talks in chapter 3 uh, about the clothing yourself with Christ and all that Christ is. Uh, and then that is important because he goes into a section in chapter 3 of Colossians telling us how then we live out this gospel, this, this new life that Christ has given us. How do we live that out as the church and within the church in the context of our relationships with the people of God? Now, I say all of that to say when we get to chapter 4, he concludes uh, this book with some instructions on how you and I are to live out this gospel, this new life that Christ has given us. How do we live that out uh, toward outsiders, toward those who are not in the church? Now, it's going to be key for us to understand. He's giving us instruction about how to live as the church, within the church, the community of Christ, and then how to live outside of the church. And right there in the middle... It's Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, as a bridge text for us. And in this, Paul is giving us the instructions on the keys to living, or the key, I believe, to living the Christian life. Last spring, my wife and I were given the generous opportunity to go to a house down at Indian Beach. Uh, some of the friends of the seminary and friends of folks in our own church have a, an incredible house there at... Um, uh, on the Bogue Sound at Indian Beach on the coast of North Carolina, and they had offered that to us for a week. And uh, I'd been there before, so I knew about the house. Just to describe it for you, it is on the water. You can watch the sunset over the Bogue Sound. It's incredible views. Uh, the house has about five stories, three decks on it that we can just sit in. Our kids were just overwhelmed. It's in a place that I don't think I would ever be able to live. You got a short golf cart ride right across the street to uh, the beach. It was cool and rainy that week. So my wife had had all kinds of things planned for us to do 
uh, over the week that we were there. Uh, it's about a two and a half hour drive from my house out to this house, and so we're driving down there on a Sunday. I'd preached that morning, got in the car, and we started driving to this house. Uh, beautiful week at the beach, all kinds of grandeur in my children's uh, minds, in my mind, about a, a week away and resting. And as we were on Highway 58, crossing the bridge over the sound to get onto the island, I had a sheer moment of panic in my mind. And it was this, did I bring the key? Do I have the key to even get us into this house, this wonderful house, all of its amenities, all of the views, all the sights and sounds, all of the things that we want to do this week. Um, we dreamed about, talked about sunset dinners, the relaxation, playing games with the family, all of that. And I'm thinking we might not even have a place to stay if I can't get us into this house. I have to have the key. All of those things dependent on getting into the place to stay. And for a second, I panicked because I thought I'd left the key. I told myself multiple times, by the way, that week, uh, the, uh, the friend of this family in our church had gotten the key from them and given it to me and said, this is the key to the house. I laid it on my nightstand and I thought every time I saw it, don't forget the key Sunday. Don't forget to grab that. Sunday after we got home from church, I changed clothes. I saw the key and I said, don't forget to get that before you leave. So I'd had these thoughts about knowing that I needed to get the key. And, uh, but then in that moment, as we're riding over the bridge, two hours from our house, that fleeting thought, had I forgotten the key, sent my heart racing. We've all had those moments, maybe not with a key for you, but maybe it's something else that what you want to do or enjoy, do I have what it would take? Do I have the key to that? Maybe it's a code to something. Maybe it's a ticket. Uh, I've shown up at games before and thought, did I get the tickets? I've actually shown up in past days that most of you will not remember when you actually had to buy a paper ticket to get on an airplane. I've shown up at the airport and thought, did I bring my ticket to the airport? Can I even get on this plane? Uh, today, it would be more like if you try to get into an airport without your driver's license or something like that, you can't get on the plane. What's it look like? And that moment when you wonder, did I remember the key? I think this morning in chapter 4 of Colossians, I want to show you that the same way that that key was to open up a house and all of the possibilities and the blessings of my family on a spring break last year, Prayer is the key that opens up the work of God for His church. Prayer is the key that opens up the work of God for and in His church. In other words, prayer is the life and the power of the church. Paul teaches us about prayer in Colossians chapter 4, and I, I want you this, this morning to come to a moment of panic, if you will, in your life, asking the question, have I forgotten the key? Because prayer is a tool that God has given us. He's given to believers for use in accomplishing His mission. Prayer is a tool that God has given to believers for use in accomplishing His mission. So Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, the basic command of this entire text that we're going to look at, devote yourselves to prayer. Devote yourselves to prayer. Now, I mentioned chapter 4, verse 2 here is a bridge, and so I first want us to ask, if Paul is telling us, devote ourselves to prayer, we have to ask, what is prayer? Well, I want you to know, as this bridge moment in Paul's letter, prayer is key for us to live out our faith among Christians, among the body of Christ, to do all of the things he told us in chapter 3, and I'm not going to go back and grab those, but he tells us to be like Christ, to put on Christ as we are new believers and what that looks like in the context of our relationships. Now, we will look at how he tells us that prayer helps us to live among outsiders, to know in this bridge we need help, and the help God gives us is prayer. And so we've got to ask the question then, what is it? What is prayer? I'll give you a quick definition. Prayer is the major means of communication that we have with the living God. Prayer is the major means of communication that we have with the living God. Have you really thought about the fact that the God of the universe, the one who uh, created all that is, the one who redeems us, the one who invites us into relationship with Him, the one who has done everything we read about in the Scriptures has invited you to come to Him and He wants to hear 
from you. It is a delight to him to hear from you. And so God has given us a means of communication. Now there are multiple words in the text of Scripture that help us understand what prayer is. But I want you to know this morning that at the heart of all of those words... Prayer really is about requests and petitions. You might have heard uh, that word in the text. Requests and petitions. When Paul says in chapter uh, 4 verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer, the word he's using there is a Greek word that's, that's a general word that really encompasses all that prayer is, but most often it even means petitions, asking God. So God has spoken to us by His Spirit through the Word. So we hold the Bible. This is the way God speaks to us. And then He invites us then to speak to Him, and that is through prayer. So of course, prayer will include praise and adoration of God. It will include confession and repentance and, and thanksgiving, even as we see in this text. Devote yourself to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. But the heart of our prayers really is us going to God and asking Him to be with us to do things. It's expressing our desires to God. It's bringing Him our petitions. By the way, there are helpful systems of prayer that some of you no doubt have heard about. I'll just share with two of them with you very quickly. One of them is ACTS, A-C-T-S. Some of you have heard of this one. Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, and Supplication. It's a good way to, to kind of think about what am I doing in prayer. I'm, a, I'm, I'm a, a giving adoration to God. I'm confessing sin. I'm giving thanksgiving to God. And then I'm making my request known. Supplication. There's another one that I've heard recently. It's just pray. Pray stands for praise, repent, uh, ask, and then yield yourself to the Lord. So another helpful system. Praise, repent, ask, and yield. Now systems are helpful for us in thinking about prayer as we begin to grow our prayer life. Let me warn you just for a moment about the danger of the systems. The heart of prayer is really communication with God. And if I had a system like uh, Acts that uh, demanded the way that I, or, or formed the way that I talk to my wife all the time, you know, and I just had four categories and I went through those four categories the same way, I don't think any of us would call that true communication with my wife. So systems are helpful to begin to think about what are the parts of prayer, but at the heart of prayer is really you opening up who you are to the Lord, sharing with Him your fears, your thanksgivings, your requests. God, here's what I need. Here's what the world needs. Uh, here's what I'm asking you. And so at the heart of our conversation with God, we're revealing our thoughts and desires to God more and more. And God has given us a means by which to do that. The book of Hebrews says that you and I are invited to the throne of grace where we'll find help and God says to come boldly before his throne there God delights by the way in you asking him Proverbs chapter 15 verse 8 the Bible says the prayer of the upright is his delight and so why is it his delight because prayer really is a manifestation of your dependence upon God God wants you to know that you are completely dependent on him for us as believers to fail to pray is really for us to say, God, I don't need you. I've got this. By the way, that's why a lot of us have what I would call uh, a spare tire view of our prayer life. You don't just use your spare tire. As a matter of fact, you don't even look at it or check it or think about it until you got a flat. And in that moment, you know, I need something that I don't now have on this car. And so you get around and you get that spare tire out hoping it works. So a lot of us have that kind of view of prayer. We got our lives all right until something goes wrong, and then we want to go to God in prayer. Prayer is meant to be your continual communication with the Lord. So this is why Paul says, devote yourself to prayer. Uh, one biblical scholar named N.T. Wright says that this is not talking about being passionate about prayer. Rather, it's being regular, steady, and thorough in your prayer. Regular, steady, and thorough. Uh, devoted is a regular and persistent asking of God. Jesus teaches us, by the way, on this persistence in, a, in an incredible way. In two passages in the New Testament, let me just mention them to you. Matthew chapter 7, some of you have no doubt heard, uh, Jesus teaching in the Sermon on the Mount says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open. 
The Greek tense of those words is literally ask and keep on asking. It's ask, but don't stop. Ask and keep on asking. Uh, knock and keep on knocking. And so God is telling us, uh, pr be persistent in prayer. Uh, Jesus even goes so far as to say that He delights in those who pester Him. Now that sounds really strange, doesn't it? But He gives us a parable in Luke chapter 18. He tells the parable about uh, our need and the need for us to always pray uh, to Him and never give up. There's a widow that kept going to a judge asking Him to give her justice against her adversary. He was unwilling to do so, but she kept going and kept going and kept going. And the Bible uses the term pestering the judge. And finally, the judge says, even though I don't fear God or respect people, yet because this widow keeps pestering me, I will give her justice so that she doesn't wear me out by her persistent coming. And Jesus is teaching you, this is the way that you should pray. He says, by the way, it's a mark of your faith to pester Him in prayer. Some of us get tired and think, well, Lord, can I keep on asking? God delights in you telling Him, pestering Him so much that you're saying, God, I don't have this. I need you. And you go to the Lord over and over and over again such that the Bible uses the term God delights in you pestering Him. So, Paul says, devote yourselves to that, to that kind of prayer. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, what are you devoted to? What are you really devoted to in your life? Uh, if I were to ask those people closest to you, what is this person devoted to? If you were to ask the people that are closest to me, I think they would say a few things about me that I'm devoted to. As I look at my schedule, uh, as I look at the way that I spend all of the time, talent, and treasure that God's given me, uh, what am I devoted to? One of the things I tell you I'm devoted to is I'm devoted to sleep. I, I spend a, a major part of every 24-hour day sleeping, and I don't like to skip it. I'm devoted to going to bed, right? Uh, and so sleep is one of those things. I'm devoted in the like manner. I'm devoted to eating. Right? It's, it's rare that I miss a meal. And if I miss a meal, I'm going to make up for it. Uh, we could say we, we eat three times a day. Some of you eat five times a day or whatever it is. We're devoted to that. I mean, we're not going to miss a day without eating unless it's an intentional thing. And then we, we call that fasting and we look forward to the time we break our fast. We're devoted uh, to eating. Uh, I'm devoted to, to work. Uh, I work and I go to work every day and I do the thing that God's called me to do. You're devoted to school when you're in school and you do that. You might not like it, but you're devoted to it because it's an everyday, regular activity. Uh, I'm devoted to a couple of other things that you would know and you might say, well, I'm devoted to you know, recreation, right? So I'm, I'm devoted to running. I get up really early and, and go running four mornings a week. Uh, I'm trying to do a half marathon again in April, and so I'm devoted to running right now. I'm trying to run about 20 miles a week. Sometimes I'm going up. I will get up to about 30 miles a week. I think if you're running that, you've got to be devoted to it to do it. Some of you are devoted to sports. Watch the Super Bowl last week. I don't know who could be devoted to Kansas City or 49ers, but some people must be because they still play. Uh, but you're devoted to a sports team, maybe a college team, maybe a particular sport. You like basketball or you like some other sport. You're devoted, some would say, I'm devoted to my church. I mean, I spend all the time there. When I was growing up, I grew up in a family that went to church all the time. We were there Sunday morning, Sunday night. I was in a youth Bible study Monday. I was in youth leadership Tuesday, and then we went to church Wednesday night. So, like, I felt like my family was either sleeping uh, at school or I was at church. I was devoted to church at that time. So what are you devoted to? Are you devoted to even your family, to your friends? Paul says, devote yourself to prayer. Now, all of these things that I brought up, I have arguments to show you. If you knew my life, you would be able to see what I was devoted to. It would be evident to you because of the way I spend my resources, my time, my talent, my treasure for those things. And Paul is giving us a command here in Scripture. If prayer is this gift that God has given us by which we communicate with the living God. He says, be devoted to it. But not only that, not only does God delight in you pestering Him, He says here, it's not going to be easy. Something you're devoted to takes uh, um, discipline. So He says, stay alert in it. 
If you're like me, this is an instruction that you have to work at. We're always on the go. Uh, we're used to changing our train of thought. Uh, we're told now in our culture in our day about every two to three minutes, which means some of you in this little bit of time that I've had have thought about and been about 16 different places in your own mind already. You've checked Facebook, Instagram, you've looked at your email, you're searching the internet, also. screens make us not able to really stay involved in one thing all the time. Uh, I'm, that's upstairs if you want to talk about reality and Instagram, go to that one later. I'm just going to say that's a reality of our world. So for me to stay alert in prayer takes work for me. In our entertainment and recreation society, we struggle to keep our minds focused. I, I think if you were honest and we were all to just raise our hands, we struggle to really think about and stay alert, to stay in focused on prayer. Uh, we struggle to focus our attention any length of time, don't we? And I just want you to note here, just a side note, if your prayer is not a living, ongoing conversation with God, then it really will get monotonous and boring and it is hard to stay engaged in that so in other words if your prayer is not a, a live conversation about who you are what you're learning from God speaking to you through his word and what you're really asking God to do and sit and praising him for doing in your life then your prayers become like those blessings that we say all the time and it's just the same words you know God is great, God is good, and they really don't mean anything to us because we're not in constant communication. It's hard to stay alert in it then. Your prayer life will be boring. If your prayer is so self-centered and not really about the relationship with God, if it's not about being with God, then it'll be hard to stay engaged. So not only do we struggle with our focus to really stay focused in a, in a conversation with God, we often struggle to stay awake. I'm not sure when you do your prayer time, but the majority of folks do kind of a, a set prayer time either in the morning or the evening. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 10, this same word, stay awake, uh, uh, stay alert in it, is contrasted with being asleep. I know this. Some of us really want to pray. We really, we want to really want to pray, and yet we find it hard. We go to bed at night and say our prayers, and we end up asleep and don't finish anything. Or we get up early in the morning, and, and you end up just falling asleep and being back tired. You know their requests that you need to make. You know that it is a key that opens up so many of God's blessings, but it's hard. So let me just say this to you. You've got a plan to stay alert. You've got a plan to stay alert in prayer. I'll say it this way. Your alertness in prayer is directly related to your preparation for prayer. So there are times when I'm praying and I start dozing and I'll just get up and do 25 push-ups. Or I'll get up and walk and just pray as I'm walking. Because it's hard. I, I have yet to fall asleep while I'm jogging or walking. Might be possible, but I've not done it. So when I know that I'm struggling to stay focused or to stay alert, I do something that helps me not fall asleep. Maybe you don't struggle with falling asleep when you get still and your mind begins to focus. I do. I will say this. If you're all stay in your bed or get snug in this little chair and cover up and, and you start to doze. and man, Do something about that. Have a different place. Uh, one of the things that I would teach you is that you, um, you associate places with things to do. So just a, a, a note about uh, my grandfather. He had his chair. Uh, and his chair was a place that he would watch television and sleep. And so if you ever tried to read in his chair, whether it's reading us a book or reading his Bible, he would go to sleep in his chair. Why? Because his chair was a place he goes to sleep. So if you pick a place that you're trying to pray or, or read your Bible that you typically just kind of zone out or go to sleep, you're probably going to do what you normally do in that place. So he would get up and find another place, and that's where he would read his Bible, and that's where he would pray. And if he started going to sleep there, he'd get up and leave that place because this is the place he wanted his body to associate, his mind to associate with being alert. And so do the same thing in your life. Stay alert in it, he says. And then he says, with thanksgiving. Gratitude has been a major theme of this entire book for Paul. He sprinkles it throughout this text, but here he says, our prayer is to be with thanksgiving. Why would we pray with thanksgiving? Because we have a confident expectation that God answers prayer. 
So we can pray. We can bring our requests to God, expressing our dependence upon God. And in the middle of that, we know, God, I'm going to thank you because you, I know you hear my prayers and I know you're working. Students, God is working in this world. He hears and He answers. So as you ask God things, do so with gratitude that God hears you, He answers you, and God acts. So say things like, God, thank you that you hear me. Thank you that you know everything. Even the stuff that I don't know that, about what I'm asking. Sometimes you and I, we've got one view. You know, Think about your life as kind of this parade. You're standing in a crowded street, shoulder to shoulder with everybody. The, your life is going by and you see what's here. God's standing on top of the highest building looking at the entire parade. He knows everything about it. You have this one view and you're saying, God, here's what I'm seeing. Would you do this? But thank you that you see the whole thing and I want to trust you that you see the whole thing. And so do your prayers with thanksgiving. Come to God making your request with thanksgiving. So prayer is a tool that God has given believers. Devote yourself to it. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. Uh, my definition continues, though. It's not just a tool that God has given us. The key actually opens up benefits and, and blessings of God. And so here, Paul turns to one specific area of prayer in verse 3. One specific request, although you know there are multiple requests. And so the second thing I want you to see in verses 3 and 4 really is that prayer is a tool through which God works to accomplish His mission. So prayer is a tool for you. What is it? Now, it's a tool through which God works to accomplish His mission. This is one request. We know that God hears our prayers, a request for all manners of issues. But here, we're going to focus on God being the life and power of the church. And what God has commissioned the church to do is make disciples. And so, Paul really drills down in Colossians 4 on the mission of God, the mission of the church. And so, he says, verse 3, look at the text with me if you have your copy of God's Word. At the same time... Now, in other words, as you devote yourself to God, at the same time, pray also for us. Pray for us. Pray that God would work on our behalf. Who's the us here? Well, we're introduced to a whole team of people in Colossians. It might just be Paul and Timothy, but there are a lot of other folks that are mentioned here. What we're going to find, even in the text that we're reading here together, is that Paul is in prison and there's a team of folks doing ministry around him. So I want you to note this. What are we asked by Paul under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, to do? What are we praying for Paul and his companions? Well, he's in prison for his gospel work, and so what is he going to ask them to ask God for? If you were here in a prison, you might say something like this, hey, as you devote yourself to prayer, pray for us. It's really cold here in this prison. The heat doesn't work, and we're miserable. It's lonely here. There's not enough people visiting. Pray that... Pray that God would release us. The food could definitely be better. Could you just pray that we get better food? Some of you feel like that sometimes in our schools. These chains are cumbersome. Pray that the chains would get released. Pray that uh, we would be able to sleep. The bed here is hard. No, Paul says here, pray that the gospel would be advanced. Pray for us. Pray that the gospel... Notice Paul's passion here. Notice what he says. I love this text. He says, pray also for us that God may open a door for us for the Word, to speak the mystery of Christ. Pray that God opens doors for the Gospel. Some of you know the name of John Piper. Piper, years ago, um, has a well-known teaching on prayer that he compared our American view of prayer uh, is more like an intercom system, a domestic intercom system, he calls it, as opposed to a wartime walkie-talkie. Now, before the advent of cell phones, I had, a, I had grandparents who had uh, an intercom system in their home. And so we thought it was the neatest thing in the world that, uh, you know, every phone we had was connected to the wall. I mean, it was like mounted on the wall. And it was really cool that you could go downstairs or in a bedroom or in the main room and push a button. And it was like a little walkie-talkie mounted in their wall. And you push the button and you could talk to somebody in the other room. And as a five-year-old kid, I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. So we would run downstairs and call back up to my grandmother 
and uh, ask her, hey, is lunch ready or is breakfast ready? Or could, could you get us some Coke or something like that? And we thought it was the most fascinating thing in the world to be able to communicate up and down within a house about the normal things that are communicated in a house. And John Piper uses that illustration. He says, most of us see prayer like that as we're just making requests to God all the time of, hey God, I need some more Coke or I need food today or I need this. Now it's fine for us to talk to God about those things, but Piper tells us that uh, the way that the Bible speaks about prayer is more like a wartime walkie-talkie. We have been given a mission and we're not on a cruise ship. We are on a warship. We have a mission and it's against Satan. Piper gets that illustration from what Paul is talking about right here in, in Colossians 4. Pray for us that God may open a door for us to us for the word. It's as if Paul and his companions have been taken prisoner as they are fighting for the gospel and they have this wartime walkie-talkie on the front lines and they are already under attack and they're calling back saying, hey, ask for air support. Ask for God to send in the air support to blow open a door that we might be able to share the gospel boldly. That's what Paul is telling us. So God opens doors for the advance of the gospel. He answers his prayers and he loves for us to pester him. He loves for us to delight or he delights in us to come to him and ask him. And because we are at war, Piper says, and in a, on mission for God, what you and I need to do is ask God to open doors. Paul is saying because we are trying to rescue those who are in bondage to sin and we are trying to rescue those who are dying and on their way to hell, ask God to open doors for the gospel. This is the life of the church. I want you to know this. God has given us a means of communication by which you and I can ask Him to help us do what He's called us to do and He will respond. God open doors of communication that we might in our schools, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, that we might be able to live out the gospel. We need God to do that. God is the one that has the power to open doors for the word so that the word may penetrate and bring people out of darkness into the light. He says so that we may speak the mystery of Christ. What's well, the mystery of Christ? The, the gospel. Prayer is the life and power of the church because it is by prayer that God opens those doors. He responds to your prayers. I want you to go out of here today knowing that God hears your prayers and He responds to them. He delights in you coming to Him. Ask Him to help you accomplish His will. And that is a prayer He always answers. And Paul knew the will of God is for us to bring people to know Christ, to bring people into the kingdom of God. And so he says, devote yourself to prayer. And as you do so, pray for us also that God would open doors here. Not only has God opened doors for the gospel, God empowers us to share the gospel. Paul's desire here is to make the gospel known. He prays help that, that God would open the door so that we may speak the mystery of Christ. Pray for those in the harvest. Pray for those that are, that are asking others to come to the Lord. We actively petition God to open doors and to empower believers to speak boldly. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, When I preach the gospel, I cannot boast since I'm compelled to preach. Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. So I would say as you and I think about prayer as the power and life of the church, pray for Pray for people that are working in your church. Pray for your pastors, your small group leaders. Pray for people that are leading you uh, in other ways. Pray for missionaries that God would open doors and empower them. Pray for each other. So as you think about devoting yourself to prayer and you think, okay, what am I going to pray about? How am I going to pray? Pray for people that you know are sharing the gospel. Pray that God would open doors. It will be the life of the church. Our churches will push back against the darkness of this world if we pray. Notice Paul reminds them this gospel for which I am in chains. I want you to note something right there. Chains are not the hindrance to Paul sharing the gospel. He's not saying pr that pray that I get out of the chains. He's saying pray that we'll speak boldly. 
there are circumstances that you're going to face in your life and, and you're going to say, man, if I could get out of this circumstance, then everything would be okay. Paul says the chains aren't the hindrance. I need you to pray that God would open the doors. It's, it's the doors that Satan's trying to keep closed. That's the hindrance. Open the doors, O oh God. May we see and understand, friends, that we hold the key. We hold the key to God busting open doors for His mission to go across the world. He has severed. He will sever any hold that Satan has. The reality is, if you and I are not praying, then God can't answer those prayers. I really believe that if prayer is a tool that God's given us by which He's promised to work responding to our petitions to Him, then there are thousands of things, blessings and ways that God could open doors that you and I are missing out on because we fail to pray. God has the power. Will we ask Him? Will we ask Him? When God works... In response to our prayers, I'll say one last thing. He does so through praying, and in that praying, what we realize in this text in verses 4 through 6 is that, that God will prepare us even through the act of praying. So Paul naturally here turns to how are we to be a part of God's mission. So prayer is a tool that prepares believers to accomplish God's mission. Paul turns in verses 5 and 6 from prayer for God to work to how we are to act in our lives. From the vertical life of prayer for God's mission actually to our horizontal lives as part of God's mission. And so in this act of say, devote yourself to prayer and, and pray for us, Paul says, and that in itself is going to prepare you to be a part of God's mission. So he says, act wisely toward outsiders. Literally, walk wisely in your own life. His opening prayer for the Colossians in this very book, by the way, in chapter 1, verse 9, was that they may be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now He's admonishing them to live wisely in the world until Christ returns. So let me say it this way. God is on a rescue mission in our world, and He wants you to be a part of that rescue mission. He's invited you to be a part, and He's given you prayer as a gift to ask Him to open doors to ask Him to empower you to share the gospel and others. And then in the asking, in the praying, in the dependence upon God in our prayers and thanksgiving, that is preparation for us to actually, what Paul says here, walk wisely in that. And so he gives you this. Look at what he says in verse 5. Making the most of the time. Making the most of the time. He's saying make the most of every <clears throat> excuse me, every opportunity. And literally, you could read that in the Greek that says this, buying up every opportunity. It's a good way to translate it, making the most of, but uh, the words could, could be translated just as easily, buying up the opportunities, looking for stuff, and, and taking advantage of every opportunity. I told you a moment ago that uh, I'm running. When I run, I need shoes about every three, 350 miles. I need new shoes. Uh, so that's pretty often to run and get new running shoes. Uh, and I am a sucker for a good bargain because good running shoes aren't cheap. And so I get made fun of for the running shoes that I make because I don't care what color they are. I just want to know how much they cost. Uh, I am always, so I, I look at websites like The Climb and all kinds of stuff like this. I'm always looking for a good bargain. I'm buying up every opportunity. And when I find a really good bargain, I typically, my wife can't stand this, but I'll typically buy three or four pair of those kind of shoes. So I've got these like really, really neon, glow-in-the-dark, yellow running shoes. And when I wear them, everybody makes fun of me. And I don't really care because I'm making the most, buying up every opportunity. And that's what Paul's saying here to you. When you see things in your life, when you see relationships, opportunities in your life, buy up every opportunity to do God's will. So we're praying for open doors and then we're buying up every door that God opens we're going through it. God, let me serve you in the midst of that. Then he says two other things. Speak with graciousness. Let your speech be always gracious, seasoned with salt. That just means don't speak down to outsiders. Speak with kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. Uh, 
I, I want to say this to us that a lot of what we do in our lives in failing to uh, see God accomplish His mission through the church is our lack of prayer. But a lot of what we do in seeing the mission of God not advanced is the way that we talk to others and act in front of others. So he says, speak with graciousness. Season with salt. It's just a, a metaphor. Jenny, my wife, often says to me, Stephen, it's not what you say. Sometimes it's how you say it. That's what Paul's saying here. Season with salt. Let your words be seasoned with salt. And then finally he says, treat each person individually. He says, so that you may know how you should answer each person. God, help us to pray to know how we can talk with others and every person is unique. As unique as you are in the way that you see your life, know that God is wanting you to see that everybody else that you speak to is unique. So you're praying, God, open doors. Help us buy up the opportunity to speak with graciousness, season with salt, and realize every person, every one that is trapped in darkness is unique. Help me to know how to approach them so that God's mission will be accomplished through His church. Prayer really is the life and power of the church. It's a tool that God has given you by which He has promised you He will respond. So devote yourself to it. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. Pray that God would open doors. And then, even in that prayer, God's preparing you to actually walk through those doors to make the use of every opportunity to speak with graciousness and to speak uniquely to every person. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for our time this morning. I pray that you would challenge us with the wonderful gift of prayer that you've given us. And God, we'll give you praise and glory for what you do in it. Pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.